whether for better or worse. Human beings change the universe. We didn't create the universe, but we have come to find ourselves in a very special position. The destiny of that universe, which has been given to us, depends upon us. As was presented elsewhere on this website, the Nawapa program, if seen correctly, represents the choice to take responsibility for the destiny of all life on Earth, and it is a foretaste of what is yet to come, the managed extension of life into the rest of our solar system and beyond, a future that can only be ushered in by man. This relationship of man to nature was known to Vernotsky as the noosphere. On this occasion, we shall investigate further this relationship, as it is expressed in the development of the Arctic. Throughout the last several hundred million years, the Earth has been subject to a number of glaciations. It is even hypothesized that at times, the Earth may have been covered by global ice sheets. Despite this, life, as persevering and determined as it is, managed to make the best of such circumstances. Roughly 20,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum, the land currently beneath the Bering Strait was exposed due to lower sea levels caused by much of the ocean water being locked in the ice. This passageway provided an overland transportation route for many large land animals, as well as for human beings. The warming trend that began at the end of the last glaciation about 10,000 years ago, flooded this land with water and severed this overland connection. Inspired by the nighttime sky, mastery of the oceans and then inland waterways allowed the human species to use this flooding to its advantage. But rather than continuing this upward thrust to higher platforms of technological development, this mastery of the seas was perverted, becoming the basis for mastery over other peoples. The natural evolutionary shift to the next higher platform finally occurred when the new age of rail overturned the foundation for this imperial maritime system. The transcontinental railroad in the United States and the Trans-Siberian Railroad, together with many other railway systems throughout the world, were fundamentally changing the relationship of man to nature, as well as the relationship of man to man. Had it not been for the successful plots by those same imperial powers to silence the leaders of this new age of rail, the world would have been on its way to completing these rail links through the Bering Strait at the start of the 20th century instead of heading toward World War I. Now, we can breathe new life into this choked-off dream. As we have already presented on the LaRouche Pack site, to build the Nawapa project demands an improvement in the capacity and an extension of the existing rail system between the United States and Canada. At the same time, the Russians have planned for the expansion of their existing rail capacity into the Far East, with a new 970-mile-long line extending from Tinda connecting Yakutsk to Magadan. This proposal is to be completed by 2030, and then extended all the way to Uelen, totaling up to 2,500 miles of track. Back on the American side, the completion of the rail line from Fairbanks, Alaska to Wales would only leave the 65-mile-long gap crossing the international date line. The existing plans are to incorporate a double-tracked electrified rail line 
either over a bridge or through a tunnel, passing through the little and big Diomede Islands, accompanied by paved road, gas pipeline, and an electric transmission line. This crucial junction point for the world would support up to 150 trains per day, making a flow of 300 million metric tons of freight per year. And although there are no finalized plans, Russian circles are discussing the potential for an additional northern rail route along the Arctic Ocean coast, paralleling the existing Trans-Siberian route from Vladivostok to Moscow. This route, 3,000 miles long, would open up the Arctic coast to development all along the way from Egvikinat west to Khatanga and Vorkuta before connecting to Moscow and exiting the system, moving into Europe. The Arctic Circle encompasses parts of Europe, Russia, the United States, and Canada. This full rail network, completed by the Bering Strait Connection, opens up this vast territory for international collaboration and development. Siberia, stretching from the Ural Mountains to the Pacific Ocean, with an area of 5 million square miles, 75% of Russia's territory, is almost one and a half times the size of the United States. Though despite its grand size, we find only 36 million people, less than in the state of California. Underneath the surface of these permafrosted grounds, there lies an estimated 16% of the world's mineral resources, although our knowledge of this treasure is yet largely undefined. But in order to fully appreciate the implications of developing this area, we must look at it through the eyes of Vladimir Vernotsky. Being a student of the famed chemist and strong advocate of Siberian development, Dmitry Mendeleev, Vernotsky was well acquainted with the periodic table of elements. But he took the work of his predecessor to an even higher degree of organization, by laying the basis for its reassessment from the standpoint of life's influence upon non-living matter. As far as we know, the elements of the early Earth were formed out of the disk of material spun off by our Sun as a product of nuclear fusion roughly four and a half billion years ago. The current theories account for the lighter elements, up to iron, being formed in this way. Cosmic radiation from supernova in nearby galaxies is suspected of being the source of the heavier elements that we find on Earth today. Or possibly, it was polarized fusion from our own Sun. But these elements could not have achieved the degree of concentration and mineralization that they are found to have in this way alone. Vernadsky recognize the role of the biogenic migration of elements in shaping the environment that we now find on Earth. The earliest life that emerged on Earth was microscopic. Nevertheless, Vernotsky pointed out that these microscopic organisms have the highest biogeochemical energy of all living things. We know that given the proper conditions, they can cover the globe in a matter of days due to their rapid rate of reproduction. But our understanding of what the proper conditions for life are is changing dramatically as we move into areas that were once considered extreme. We find life in places such as hydrothermal vents, where water can reach temperatures beyond boiling, in extremely acidic, alkaline, or saline environments, under high pressures deep in the ocean or the crust, in areas of high radiation, or even in ice sheets. From what we can tell, the early Earth must have been such an extreme environment, with an atmosphere of sulfur, methane, carbon dioxide, and only minute quantities of free oxygen, as well as being a haven for lots of radiation, from the great concentrations of radioactive isotopes active at the surface, 
and incoming radiation from space. These early microbes could only survive and reproduce if they had developed the means to interact with the environment outside of them and maintain a very specific thermodynamic environment inside of them. For this reason, a highly specific selection process was developed as the infrastructure of the living system. Lithotrophs use the materials found in their immediate surroundings, the products of earlier cosmic radiation, for the energy they need, while phototrophs use a more advanced mechanism, obtaining their energy directly from the cosmic radiation itself. These microbes acted on a thick shell of the Earth, reaching from the top of the atmosphere to several kilometers deep into the crust. Early on, the seed nuclei of our granite continents was formed and began to grow, most likely through the transformation of cosmic radiation by phototrophs. Simultaneously, oxygen built up in the atmosphere, causing phase changes observable in the layers of rock laid down before the appearance of multi-celled creatures. As part of the process of obtaining energy through metabolism and respiration, microbes selected specific materials to build their bodies. For example, magnetotactic bacteria form crystals of either magnetite, iron and oxygen, or gregite, iron and sulfur, to make what we call magnetosomes, almost perfect single domain magnets which respond strongly to the Earth's magnetic field. Interestingly, magnetite does not form under what we might consider normal circumstances abiotically, but it is always forming in these organisms, who use these supermagnets for things like orientation. Iron is among the most abundant elements on Earth, and by making such good use of it, these microbes have concentrated it into ores that we put to good use ourselves. Many other metal ore deposits have such relations to the early work of microbes, but there is much that we have yet to learn about biomineralization. Modern experimental findings in this and related areas of research point to the underlying truth of Vernotsky's hypothesis that the Earth's crust has been thoroughly shaped by the action of living organisms. In this way, most of the mineral deposits were concentrated either by direct action of the organisms themselves or through the new environment these organisms created. In every such deposit around the Earth, we find the result of billions of years of biogenic activity. Look back at the Arctic as we find it in our time today. With 9,000 mineral deposits registered, of which you see only the largest here. Siberia, for example, has 90% of the world's palladium, 80% of its tantalum, 40% of the platinum, 36% of the nickel, 27% of the tin and iron, and 16% of its zinc, just to name a few. It ranks first in potash and diamonds, second in phosphorites, and third in gold. Throughout the relatively short history of human civilization, man has used his mind to make advances in technology, allowing him to utilize more and more of the elements in the periodic table, and to even make new ones. In the case of the biosphere, the relationship between life and its environment is reciprocal. Life develops in response to its environment and then further changes its environment. In the noosphere, man chooses what his environment should be and then creates it through discoveries and inventions. Man selects the elements, naturally occurring or man-made, for the materials we use in creating the infrastructure for society, in a process we may call noogenic migration. But if this is what humanity does, why do we tolerate such poverty as we find in China and India today? 
Could an advanced species such as mankind develop any further without improving the conditions of two-thirds of its people? What, therefore, are the standards of living that we must maintain worldwide to wield this power of man? Developing these resources in Siberia, laying these rail connections, and raising new cities is the basis for establishing these standards. Think of this potential. This cannot be a looting ground for empire, but rather, this gives us the opportunity with which we shall uplift humanity out of its miserable condition, if we choose to act freely in this way. And if the United States were to lead the way, working with the nations of Russia, China, and India now, we can get started. Having set this process into motion, we can then turn to some of the questions whose answers have deeper implications for the continued existence of man. The economic development of Alaska, the development of the Bering Strait Bridge, multiple hydroelectric dams, and the numerous new nuclear-powered major industrial cities, which would have to be developed to affect and maintain these changes, puts us in a very interesting place. Combined with the economic development of Siberia by Russia, and the prospects of finally opening up northern Canada to development, the presence of man in this region gives us as a species new capabilities which have never existed up to this point. As was the case with the Tennessee Valley Authority, the economic development of these once backward regions will allow them to leapfrog the rest of the world and become instead the most technologically advanced regions of this planet. Currently, Isolated U.S. and Russian research stations exist in the Arctic, some floating on ice flows and others trapped deep inland through miles of snow. With the extended capabilities provided to them by the effects of Nawapa, they will be in a position to answer some of the most important standing questions about the nature of life, the biosphere, and the organization of our solar system. Is the expansion of the biosphere limited to life on Earth? The development of man, the only being on the planet capable of yearning to know what exists beyond its bounds, yields an emphatic no to that question. But how will we extend life to other planets, such as Mars? There, the atmosphere is made up mostly of carbon dioxide, unsuitable for animal respiration. The magnetic field is weak and not unified across the entire planet, raising again unanswered questions about the relationship between living processes and our own Earth's magnetic field. Temperatures vary wildly, between 70 degrees Fahrenheit at the equator to minus 200 degrees at its poles in winter. Again, such extremes force us to reconsider the very definition of the word life. Ground patterns characteristic of permafrost are very visible on some parts of the Martian surface, and they will provide an engineering challenge to us comparable to that which we face in Arctic engineering. To help us with all of these questions, we must take advantage of the unique characteristics provided to us by Earth's polar regions. The infrastructure discussed here as the development of the Nawapa program aids us in just this venture. The geographic North Pole is determined by Earth's rotation about its axis, about 23 degrees from the perpendicular to the ecliptic. For Mars, this inclination is about 25 degrees. These polar regions see the greatest amount of change between seasons. Polar night in winter on Earth lasts months. In the Arctic, temperatures range from 50 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 90 degrees. We know that the polar regions of Earth 
play a large role in the circulation of ocean currents, which themselves play a large role in regulating global climate? Might the control over salinity and temperature in these areas give us an advantage in managing the periodic glaciations discussed earlier? One proposal was made in the 1960s to place a dam across the Bering Strait, permitting man's conscious control over the flow of water from the Arctic to the Pacific, and thereby the local temperature of the Arctic Ocean, potentially opening up new sea routes and possibilities for ocean mining. This, combined with the necklace of high-speed rail which will encircle the Arctic Ocean, gives the Arctic region the potential to become for the modern world what the Mediterranean once was for the ancient world. Earth's magnetic field and its role in relation to the interplanetary magnetic field, which forms a large part of the structure of our solar system, is little understood. The theories proposed for the development of the magnetic fields of the Earth and Sun fall far short of explaining the observed facts. Further, the relationship between the Earth's magnetic field and the development of life here is hinted at by much evidence, though it is also little understood. Numerous animals use the Earth's magnetic field for navigation or are intimately connected with it in other ways. Experiments show that the human sense of time is highly dependent upon the magnetic field of the Earth, and it is even possible that the bone loss and other physiological changes experienced by astronauts is closely related to, among other things, the changes in electromagnetic environment that they experience as they move farther from Earth's womb. Above the Arctic, the aurora borealis gracefully reminds us of the nature of the significance of Earth's electromagnetic phenomena. The Earth's magnetic field is such that much of what comes to us from the sun is channeled toward the poles. Flows of matter directed by the sun interacting with the ionosphere of the Earth cause the northern and southern lights. The material which is accelerated into the Earth's atmosphere come partly from the sun's own surface and are partly composed of extragalactic matter captured by the sun and directed along complex field lines towards the surface of the earth. Other extragalactic particles are directed away from paths which would intersect the earth, permitting changes in earth's atmosphere and correlating strongly with changes in the diversity of life indicating a major role played by cosmic radiation in the process of evolution. This implies, rather than a randomly generated and chaotic interplanetary electromagnetic field, something whose intention is the evolution of living processes. Reciprocally, the atmosphere, the other half of the function creating the aurora, is entirely a creation of living processes and forms a domain of complex interaction with various forms of solar and cosmic radiation. It is possible, even likely, that Earth's magnetic field is partly or entirely created by living processes as well. What more could be learned about its peculiarities? We have evidence that the magnetic poles wander near the geographic poles and that over the course of the Earth's history, the north and south magnetic poles have reversed many times. What implication does all of this have for the creation of a biosphere on Mars? These aurora are weaker than those on Earth, invisible to the naked eye, in fact, so this image is taken in the ultraviolet, and they are unevenly distributed. This is because Mars lacks a planetary magnetic field, and instead has a patchy but significant residual crustal magnetism. The process by which material is accelerated to produce Mars's aurora is still unknown. Is this difference between the electromagnetic environment of Earth and Mars 
related to the possible lack of widespread living processes on the surface of that planet? What living or non-living processes will we find beneath its surface? What is the difference between the roles of Mars, Earth, and the Sun, respectively, within that great interconnected web we call the interplanetary magnetic field, which is so finely structured that it is capable of funneling material directly between various heavenly bodies? The more that we examine such territories, the more we push the limits of our current definition of life. We find life thriving in the polar regions under conditions that were thought to be impossible a few decades ago. Microbes were found in Alaska that were alive after being frozen 32,000 years. A whole class of virus, known as Marine Group A, rare in other parts of the Earth's ocean and typically found only in deep ocean samples, thrives underneath the Arctic ice and may play an important role in engineering ocean life and affecting the composition of Earth's atmosphere. Other psychrophiles, organisms that love the cold, were found that withstand amounts of gamma radiation which would be lethal to most other living organisms. The same NASA report where these were detailed states that thick ice sheets can provide protection from the hard vacuum and the radiation environment of space and can create localized conditions suitable for the needs of specific microorganisms. These findings from a few expeditions raise questions about what other forms of life exist not only on our own planet, but in other areas of the solar system, such as under the polar ice caps of Mars. We can also reverse the question. How might these organisms help to bioengineer a suitable environment on Mars? There are various other questions in this field of study which go beyond the scope of this introductory presentation. For instance, will the introduction of microbes affect the creation and maintenance of a new magnetosphere on Mars as well? The possibility of answering such looming questions makes it very clear that NAWAPA is much more than an interesting option for the future. It, and the subsequent development of the Arctic that it opens up to us, are, among its myriad other associated effects, nothing short of the next evolutionary step for the development of the noosphere. This is even clearer when viewed as though from far above. From maritime culture, to inland waterways, to rail, to nuclear power and the mastery of the atom, to the complete conscious control of weather systems on Earth, to the ability to leave Earth, the development of thermonuclear fusion, and the necessary shaping of the phenomena of so-called space weather, cosmic radiation, Nawapa is a crucial next step on a series of higher and higher platforms moving mankind ever deeper and deeper into a realization of its role as co-creator in the universe.